I'm home court, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? I'm home court, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? They ain't believe in me in the beginning. Who wanna hang around now they see me winning? I'm home court, she's standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? What's up, world? It's your boy Big Court here on the Holding Court Podcast with my partner, producer Ken. What's up with you, man? I was chilling, man. How you doing? I'm good, bro. You know, we here. We here, man. We working. So today we got a special guest, very special guest. Um, Man, this guy been around a long time. I'm sure y'all know his work and I'm sure you know his name. You know what I'm saying? I would consider him, you know, rap impresario. Would that be accurate? Can I call you that? Oh, you can call me that. I have, I'm not sure I heard that one before. But exactly. I, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like That's that. some new shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> Motherfuckers talk about T.I. and his words. I got him beat. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, man, we got the homie, uh, owner of The Source, owner of uh, Hip Hop Weekly. And uh, am I missing something? Well, I'm no longer the owner of either of those. I created The Source. Yeah. I uh, co-created Hip Hop Weekly. And yeah. now I'm the co-founder of breakbeat that's the new uh, network breakbeat. breakbeat media that I, I just launched uh, a couple weeks ago first hip-hop podcast network yeah uh we got some amazing content you know mm-hmm. uh excited about it okay so but y'all know his work y'all know the source everybody knew who that was widely regarded as the bible of hip-hop dave mays what's up with you my brother what's going on court man hey i appreciate Good you coming you, man. man long yeah, way brother yeah yeah definitely yeah. definitely yeah man so long man time. you've uh um, <clears throat> you've been in this hip-hop game a long time brother you yeah. know um let's start from the beginning um because i know you from the source like many people you yeah. know what i mean and you know i wasn't lucky enough <laughs> as an artist back in the day to make it to the source you know what i mean and you know everybody wanted to get the mics yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah. but let's start from the beginning where are you from uh born and raised in washington dc okay chocolate yeah. city yeah. okay yeah all right what's your what's your ethnicity uh jewish really yeah okay damn yeah. i thought it was an essay for a minute yeah no okay no. all right so you so when did you get into hip-hop like what made you fall in love with the culture um well you know growing up in dc um I was exposed at a pretty early age to like the music and the culture of the city there mm-hmm. and just kind of fell in love with it. Now, as you, you probably know, in the 80s, uh, you know, go-go was the dominant right. music and culture of mm-hmm. D.C. So I was heavy into go-go uh, mm-hmm. while I was in D.C., you know, junior high, high school. But we did get, um, you know, rap songs played on the radio there. Mm-hmm. So I remember Rapper's Delight. I knew every word when that yeah. came out. I was yeah. in maybe sixth grade. Um, and then when The Message came out, that was a song I remember just really, you know, being moved by. Yeah. Um, but um, it wasn't until I left D.C. and went to college at Harvard when I kind of fully jumped head first into hip hop because I was heavy go go. I went to Harvard. I had my go go tapes with me and okay. you know, I was ready to to bring the go go around yeah. the world, but uh it, it didn't work that way. A lot of people didn't 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 really like go go music outside of DC. It's been the case, unfortunately. But I wanna stop you right there. Hold on, homie. You went to Harvard? I went to Harvard. You yeah. graduated from Harvard? I graduated from Harvard Fuck. with a government okay. degree. Damn. Okay. Yeah. So that means you smart, smart. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Some might say. So I'm, you wasn't right. just an, obviously just an average student in school. Um, I was a good student. I did uh-huh. a lot of different things. I was, yeah. you know, extracurriculars okay. and sports and different things like yeah. that. So did you grow up a two parent yeah. household? I did. Okay. Well, what did your people, what did your folks do? Uh, well, my dad initially was, uh, working for the city government in Washington, DC. Uh-huh. Uh, he later uh, retired from that and went into like financial planning. Yeah. Uh, my mom, she uh, was a, a graphic designer and then she ended up going uh, and working at University of Maryland and got mm-hmm. her MBA and did some okay. stuff there as well. So you grew up with education being a, a focal point in, in, in the household. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. So what did you want to be when you were a kid? Like, what did you aspire to be? <laughs> well, first I was trying to make it to the NBA. That was my, we all my, was. My, yeah, yeah, that was my plan. <laughs> I was, I was going to get there. Yeah. 
Um, but what position did you play? <laughs> uh, mostly guard, you know, yeah. two two guard mostly. I got. I'm still, did you have a shot or you I had handles? Just, uh, I had a little. My handles were never great, but I, I was a scorer yeah. and all around okay. player, and you know, still am. Still get out oh, there a little boy, bit. Okay, you, know? day. For, you think you can do something with <laughs> that rock? <laughs> I still do a little something every now and then. We don't have to give you know. court. We got a court in this motherfucker. Yeah, we do. We got okay. a court in this bitch. It's holding we court. Only, it's only right. Court. You feel me? It's only right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I did a lot of stuff, and mm. but going to Harvard was different. You know, I didn't mm. really fit in there. You know, I, I wanted to go to there partly also because it was in a big city. I wanted to go yeah. to another big city on the East Coast, but I didn't realize, you know, how different – Boston was, and but especially Harvard, yeah. you know, the people there were just Man, totally different from the- That's a whole different world. Yeah, the people I grew up yeah. around in D.C. and all my friends and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what kind of, you know, got me into starting this radio show at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, which was called Street Beat. That was um, the source eventually evolved out of my radio show mm -hmm. that I was hosting uh, mm -hmm. for four years up there. Okay. Started, you know, late night on the weekends. Harvard had a pretty big radio station with a big signal, but they played classical music. Yeah. Um, but we were able to get like a little late night time slot yeah. uh, Friday night, you know, one in the morning. And back then, you know, there was hardly any, you know, rap music played on the radio. Mm -hmm. Boston didn't have even an urban FM station. Um, so the only place you could hear was on college. Mm -hmm. So people found the show and I built a big fan base of, of hip hop fans all around Boston that mm -hmm. would tune in every week and the show got bigger. And um, I was trying to sell uh, ads, sponsors of my radio show. And I was getting turned down by the local businesses, even though I knew I had a lot of listeners. They didn't couldn't re believe that people were listening to the Harvard radio station for hip hop. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting a mailing list of my listeners, had people call in. I would write down everybody's name and address all night long and mm -hmm. put it in this little database and just built up over a thousand names and addresses. And by kind of end of my sophomore year is when I came up with the idea to create the newsletter, mail it out to the mailing list. As I was answering the, all those phone calls, people were always asking for information about hip hop, you know, so I'm noticing everybody wants to know, you know, back then, 86, 87, 88, yeah. there's no way to find out about hip hop, you know, there's no newspaper, magazine, radio talking about it, television, nothing, and, you know, when is the new Public Enemy album coming out, or who mm -hmm. produced, you know, this song or that song, so I'm like, I can provide news and information mm -hmm. to the hip hop fans you know, in the form of this newsletter, which I called The Source. Well, right then, but back then you did have like right on and shit like that, but that yes. was more kind of like fan picture type shit, correct? Exactly. If I yes. remember correctly. Oh, posters totally, and shit. Totally, right yeah. on, Black Beat. And, right. You know, right. that was just, yeah, your posters, what's yeah. Slick Rick's favorite food, you know, exactly. nothing with substance really pertaining right. to hip hop. Right. So The Source really brought, you know, the substance, the culture, you yeah. know, the whole world you know so into. i mean what compelled you to come from this government major to get into media like you know what i'm saying well how did you come up with that well i i was always very entrepreneurial growing up in dc too i had like a lawn mowing business in mm -hmm. in junior high with 80 clients and business cards and wow. you know so i i was like always trying to yeah. hustle find different business ventures so i had that entrepreneurial drive um you know and then it just sort of converged the idea merged you know that entrepreneurial side with this culture and music that I was so in love with and you know was mm -hmm. my life um and uh you know then that was just everything for me right. I was like man this is it I I uh somebody gave me a book pretty early on on a history of Rolling Stone magazine mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about it uh this guy this young rock fan named Jan Winter created Rolling Stone in the 60s as an underground newspaper for rock fans and it grew into the voice of the generation you know Rolling Stone is still around today um but uh I saw a lot of parallels in the book between rock and roll and hip hop and you know, the source to become the, mm -hmm. the rolling stone of the hip hop generation. That became my idea, at least the first few years it was. And that was like, okay, I'm going to do mm -hmm. this and just, um, you know, I was just inspired to, you know, provide this uh, source of information <clears throat> right. that could, you know, right. educate, inform, entertain, empower. Right. All of that was, was part of the mix of, of the magazine. So I have a question. I mean, you growing up, and I don't know exactly, um, 
and I don't want to assume, but being that your parents were professionals, so I can pretty much, you were probably in a good area of DC. Yes. Correct. Okay. But I'm, I'm sure still in the eighties cause you got Reaganomics and you obviously were into the rap culture. So I'm sure you had a lot of black friends and you probably fraternized in the hood as well. Yes. What kept you from, you know, going that other way, even with your household being, you know, uh, together you know what i'm saying and you obviously because you know some people from the suburbs especially you know when they dealing with urban elements they get off into bullshit what kept you from doing that hmm. going that way oh i never thought about it like that but i mean it that was never really attractive to me you mm -hmm. know um it was more you know everything else about mm -hmm. the culture than mm -hmm. you know any kind of you know, negative or, or mm -hmm. criminal element. You know, I had my little share of little mischiefs and things or whatever, right, like right. we probably all did. Yeah, but, just, you know, that's the rites of passage um, of growing up, you know yeah. what I mean? So I, I just think, again, like you said, growing up in the house, it just was always instilled in me to, you know, do well in school and opportunities mm -hmm. that, I, that I had and, um, you know, what my parents, you know, kind of went through to get their educations mm -hmm. and everything like that, so... Mm -hmm. yeah. Were your parents born over here or did they migrate over here? Uh, they were born here. My mom's from Philly and my dad mm -hmm. is from the Bronx. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you got siblings too? Uh, one. One sister. She's a couple years older than okay. me. Okay. Okay. So once you launched your newsletter, which was the source, yes. right? What At what point did you realize that that was something viable? Like, okay, I might have something with this shit. I mean, it was pretty fast. I mean, even you know, like the first one was one yellow sheet yeah. of paper, front and back. Uh, so four ads on the back. Jive Records was the uh, actually national label that paid for like seventy five dollars for one, and I had <laughs> some local record stores in Boston yeah. gave me fifty bucks. Uh, the next one was six pages. The next one was sixteen pages. The next one was you know twenty four pages, and mm -hmm. I started to. Um, sell it. The first few were free. I just mm -hmm. mailed them out free to the news, you know, to the uh, mailing list and mm -hmm. sold the ads to generate the revenue. But then I'm like, you know, we can make this into a booklet, mm -hmm. put it on the counter in the mom and pop stores. You know, mm -hmm. that was really the key to blowing the source up in the early years was mm -hmm. building a distribution network in all the mom and pop record stores. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went, you know, kind of crazy with that, just calling up every mom and pop store in every city that I could find around the country. Hey, I got this new magazine, The Source. I'm mm -hmm. gonna send you, you know, 10, 20 copies on consignment, you know, mm -hmm. check it out. If it sells, mm -hmm. send me back a check and I'll send you the next one, boom, boom. And mm -hmm. it started going crazy, you know, these, you know, we were selling 100, 200 copies a month and all and these. And this was 80s still? This is 80s, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is late 80s, you know, you 89. You that old, brother. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. You know, hip-hop, it'll, it'll keep you young. Yeah, for sure, you, for sure. You know. Who was you listening um, to back then? I'm curious. Like, um, who would you say was your top five at that point? Oh, in the, in the 80s, I yeah. mean, come on, uh, Eric B. and Rakim. For sure. Um, you know, EPMD. Mm -hmm. uh, Boogie Down Productions, mm -hmm. N.W.A., Public Enemy, Ghetto Boys that grip it on that other level. Oh, that grip it on that other level. Oh, man, I, shit. I was going crazy yeah. with that. Was you fucking um, with uh, Making Trouble? That was before that album. Uh, yeah, 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 I didn't really know about Making Trouble. Yeah. I didn't really get up on the Ghetto Boys until, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, what, what was the name? The one we just said. Yeah, grip it on, grip it on level. that other level. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. First you, one before Rick Rubin. You miss LL though. Yeah. You didn't fuck with LL. Oh, LL, yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. LL, Run DMC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Um, but I really arrived at Harvard and made that transition. This is '86. Okay. You know, and that's really when you could say the emergence of the hip hop golden age begins because mm -hmm. you know you had you know even LL you had Run DMC you had right. Fat Boys but when Rakim comes yeah. out and Karis yeah. won and you know it's the it was it's more the, authentic the, yeah the lyricism because, the consciousness yeah. it becomes more of a movement right um, just something you know that really changed Big Daddy Kane yeah. you know you know stuff like that so yeah. um, that was a really exciting time you know De La Soul even you know yeah, what I mean like yeah. they were you know, hugely influential and successful in those yeah. years Queen Fat of... Boys was dope to me that was kind of a novelty act but mm -hmm. they still had their place you know sure. what I'm saying at that time you know what I mean yeah. even with Beastie Boys and all of that shit too yeah I mean they yeah. were talented the Fat mm -hmm. Boys were talented you yeah know? yeah uh, they definitely added what was you know they balanced hip hop at that time mm -hmm. yeah so so now you have this newsletter that's turning into this real business, you know what I'm saying? So at what point do you like, you know what I'm saying? I guess, I guess what point does Benzino come in? Does he come in early on at that point? Uh, well, not in the source. I, okay. I met him and we became friends in those early years because mm -hmm. he had 
um, a very successful rap group in Boston at this time. So um, that's the Made Man. Uh, no, this was the Almighty RSO. Almighty, uh, yes. Yeah, that was okay. their first group. Right. And they were making a lot of noise in Boston, mm -hmm. and I had found out about them and went out to meet them, invite them up to my mm -hmm. radio. I want to get them up on on my radio show and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So that's how we met and became friends. And mm -hmm. you know, him and uh, his DJ, uh, Def Jeff. Um, you know, uh, he became a DJ on my radio show mm -hmm. and me and Jeff became friends. I would hang out with, with him a lot and some of his guys. And, but the source, uh, was my thing and, you know, uh, they were focused on the music and, um, you know, it would be year, some years later, um, when I would bring him in, you know, mm -hmm. as a partner in the source. Okay. You know, mid what made you, uh, make that decision to um, bring him on as a partner? I mean, you know, we had been friends a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I had gone through uh, a split with some of my original partners. There were mm -hmm. some other partners that joined me at Harvard, uh, three guys actually during my Harvard years, mm -hmm. uh, John Schechter, James Bernard, and Ed Young. Uh, we all became partners in the source. Um, and by the like 94, I, I had like a falling out with a couple of them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that was sort of the time when, I was like, you know, I don't mm -hmm. have I don't have as many partners anymore right. and you know, maybe you should, you know, come in and get involved For and sure. and uh you know, just kind of went like that. Yeah. How was it doing, you know, doing business with Benzino cuz I don't know Benzino, but from the outside looking in, he looks like he could be, you know what I'm saying, a handful to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> um well, you know, again, we we had a close relationship for mm -hmm. a long time and um you know, uh we were able to accomplish a lot of things you know mm -hmm. there was some things that probably uh could have been handled differently and better yeah. um but in the grand scheme of things you know what i mean like uh that's the learning curve though. yeah you know mm -hmm. and uh you know we're not we're not partners anymore and what i'm doing now mm -hmm. uh you know kind of went our separate ways you know a few years back yeah um, was it amicable um i mean I, it, it wasn't unamicable okay um so uh it is what it is business just, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. i just wanted to you know kind of get back on my own have yeah. the kind of you know time to really yeah. put into this idea that i had yeah. been having for a while to, to create this network so so when did you now i remember the source i mean i'm not gonna lie bro i i i bought it religiously you know what i'm saying uh when so when was it mid 90s is when it really caught its stride mid about 94, 95. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Source Awards are 94, 95. Mm -hmm. Those really helped drive the, you know, the sales and the brand, especially 95 being on television. Is that where Sticky came out, shot in there? Uh, that was the first one in 94. Okay. We had yeah. Sticky on the show, too. Okay, yeah, yeah that's my guy, man. Mm -hmm. Good dude, talented dude. Yeah, that's dude. my guy, that's my yeah. homie. Yeah. yeah, it was a prop, though, remember? Oh, yeah, that's that right. Real. He said it was a prop. Yeah, yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you. There's a lot, a lot of you know, <laughs> lot of you know, rumors going around yeah. about you know, you know, what we allowed to happen at the Source Awards. Yeah, yeah. there was a little rough around the edges. You know, that was our first one. You know, we, yeah. we had never done an award. Hip hop had never had an award right, show before. Right. I mean, this was an amazing thing. Getting yeah. all of the people from hip hop, all the major players in one room and one night yeah. together, like yeah. you know, that was a huge accomplishment yeah. and and uh there was so much excitement because back then this is 94 again yeah you know hip-hop's big but we're not getting respect in the industry right. or anything in the media, Keep, in the yeah. media. nobody's yeah. taking hip-hop seriously you know nobody's getting recognized no and, you're right because I, I mean before the source i can't remember any publication really focusing on you know hip-hop solely you know what i'm saying like yeah. you would have mentions if motherfuckers was on majors and shit like that mm -hmm. like you might have too short in some because right. he had Jive, the Jive machine, but, you yeah. know, no, you guys really had it cornered, you know. Yeah. Now, the Source Awards, that's where the infamous Death Row, the Suge, is that the, that's the, that's the same award show? 95, yeah. 95? 95. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, I'm assuming you was in attendance when that shit Oh, of happened. course, yeah, I was at every Source so, Awards. So when, when Suge got up there and made that statement about Bad Boy, you know, what was your thought? Like, as the organizer, as the brand, like, was you like, what the fuck? Why the fuck did he do that? Like, what <laughs> What was your initial reaction? I mean, you know, it, it, it obviously caught me by surprise. I yeah. wasn't expecting it. No, yeah. I don't think anybody was. Um, yeah. 
but I just was like, man, I better, you know, like get down, uh, you know, backstage and see what's going on. Because I think at the time, like, you know, anyone like at any, any source awards, I was never sitting down like in the audience watching mm -hmm. the show. I was moving around yeah, for sure. all over, making for sure everything's, you know. So I think at the time I was actually in the back of the theater, mm -hmm. just kind of checking the vibes with the crowd out there mm -hmm. and what it was like. And, you know, when that happened, there was the uproar. I'm like, man, I got to you know, get down. So to when the, he said it, the, what did you, was you like, fuck. Did you start, you know, getting motherfuckers like, look, man, we need to get this shit together. Like, I mean, <laughs> I went, I went down on one side, you know, Suge and about, he had about 50, 60 guys with him there that night, which I knew. I mean, I yeah. gave him the tickets. I knew yeah. everybody's seating arrangements. I, you know, I was, I did all of that, mm -hmm. but, um, uh, they were just like kind of rampaging up and down the backstage stairs like mm -hmm. there's a bunch of ruckus going on but puff and his guys were on the other side of the stage mm -hmm. and i you know i went over to to them and you know talked to puff and he was really upset um but you know as we all know he kind of tried to you know take yeah. the higher road right. and right. you know not uh respond in kind and you know things got calmed down and you know of course snoop coming out and saying what he said had a lot of uh impact on the mood in the mm -hmm. room and everything like mm -hmm. that as well Mm -hmm. But uh, was you scared somebody was gonna get killed that night? That didn't cross my mind. Okay, you know, in real time. Uh, yeah. No, I don't remember yeah. that. I mean, but uh, no, I mean, and that's the thing. Like a lot of the source awards, sometimes people have given it, you know, a reputation of like you know violence and drama mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, that gets out of out of hand sometimes. And like I said, at that ninety five sword, there wasn't a punch thrown, wasn't right. nobody right. shot, stabbed, nothing like that. Yeah. Nothing, you know. There Actually, was... that shit happened at the Vibe Awards. That's correct. Right. That's <laughs> it correct. wasn't even the source. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So as you as you watched this this East Coast West Coast thing escalating, um, did you feel some type of responsibility in terms of being the media to either feed into it or not feed into it, but at the same time, stand in step with the conversation of what's going on in hip hop. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How um, did you navigate that? Um, carefully. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that I did, uh, over the summer of 96 is when, um, I put Suge on the cover for the first time the red suit uh, uh, in yeah, the Rolls Royce. The Rolls. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you look at that cover, it says Suge Knight, and then there's a quote from him that says, it ain't no East Coast, West Coast thing, in quotes, big on the front. So that was something, like, intentional mm -hmm. that I did was to try to get the message right off there, like, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't an East, West beef, because it really wasn't. You right. You know what I mean? It was it between was, two individuals. Right. Yeah. It was a personal mm -hmm. thing, and it was getting you know so so that you know and, and other media outlets i think were a little less responsible about mm -hmm. things in terms mm -hmm. of printing more sensationalized mm -hmm. interviews or headlines or different things like that that was always something i took seriously at yeah. the source you know just knowing what we're dealing with this is hip-hop you know this is real shit going on and mm -hmm. this is people's real lives and, sure. and you know we gotta be sensitive to these things we Absolutely. can't just operate you know like rolling stone maybe or anyone else might be able to Absolutely. because you know it's a whole different you know culture and, and community the reason i ask that is because i mean as you know you're doing a podcast as well and when you have a platform it's kind of like like we try to you know straddle the line because you want to be entertaining and you want to stay in step but like even when I have guests, sometimes they come over here, they got beef with people. So you have to be careful mm -hmm. of what you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They may be speaking their truth and talking shit or whatever the case may be. But it's like, damn, am I egging this shit on? You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. I can ask the questions, but then somebody might get killed in behind this shit. You know, right. so it's that thing where you kind of have to figure that out. You know what right. I mean? Right. Yeah. Wow. So let me ask you this. What was your because we were talking about this earlier on a different episode. What what are your what are your top 5 source uh covers? Uh top 5 source covers. Let's see. Um Dre with the gun to his head right before the Chronic <laughs> album. Right. He said you the know, same thing. That was my favorite. And it was a very instrumental cover yeah. in helping take the source to the next level because right. you know, we we put him on a cover before the Chronic drop, you know, we mm -hmm. didn't have to wait 
for everybody to figure out it was you know probably the greatest album of all time mm -hmm. uh you know and we got that exclusive cover so that was really big uh you know i also uh, like the mary j blige cover when she's sitting on the ice sculpture you know uh that's a, a really beautiful cover that my my boy chi modu shot uh rest in peace to chi you know chi took a lot of amazing covers for the source the biggie cover in front of the kind of like the twin towers in the background mm -hmm. um i mean even the dr dre leaving death row cover was yeah. was an ill one um, Foxy and Little Kim getting them together on a cover, which yeah. had never been done. They weren't really getting along, and yeah. we got them together for the cover. Um, you know, there's so many. I mean, yeah. you know, P has some amazing. Yeah, covers. he has several. Yeah, that one, one of my favorite was the one. The, yeah, with the yeah, black Kango yeah. and the money. Yeah. yeah, that one was hard. That one, I like that one. The one when y'all did Bone Thugs and they had their individual covers for mm -hmm. Art of War. Right. That and. Um, so now once you got the source going, what I want to ask is what what was the rating system, man? Because, you know, y'all got a lot of flack for that. You know what I'm saying? You get praise, you get motherfuckers mad at you and shit. Right. Who did the rating and what was the rating system for the five mics or how, or mics, period? But who did that? What, what, what was that whole process? Um, I mean, it was a collective of editors that would uh, listen to and kind of have meetings about uh, all the main albums to discuss ratings. So it was never left up to one person. You know, there would be anywhere from three, four, five, six, seven people probably mm -hmm. that might have been involved at different times in mm -hmm. music meetings every month to go through the albums and discuss the ratings. So it was something from early days mm -hmm. that, you know, we took really serious, like everything with The Source. You mm -hmm. know, it was all about being authentic and being real. And, you know, it was all about, just trying to show love yeah. to dope music and dope yeah. people, you know, that, that, uh, you know, no matter where you were from or yeah. what you, who was behind you, you know, you had an opportunity, you know, with the source, which is one of the things I'm really, you know, focused on with breakbeat, um, you know, with this new platform, because I think there's still, you know, so much opportunity, so much, you know, incredible talent that's out here that mm -hmm. needs a strong, kind of platform that that can help uh you know kind of grow together with them mm -hmm. and um so i'm excited about some of my new my new shows don't call me white girl i call her the unsigned hype mm -hmm. of breakbeat funny marco mm -hmm. is another one i would call that i mean he he's hilarious um his podcast is going to be amazing yeah. Yeah, shout out. Uh, that's the home. That's the hometown, uh, homie. You that's know what right. I'm saying? KC, right. shout out to Kansas City, KC, Missouri. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Shout out to Marco. Yeah. And, and don't call me white girl. Like I said, she's mm. just a star, man. She's going to be so big. She's so funny mm. and so smart. Um, I think she's going to be one of the top female kind of hosts and voices mm. out in the market, right. you know, in, in the near future. Yeah. Um, other stuff like that. Yeah. So I definitely want to get to that. So, yeah. Um, um, so let me ask you, because, you know, I'm doing my journalistic shit right now. So I got to ask you the hard questions. OK. Were the could the mics ever be bought? No, the mics were never bought. Um, unless some shit went on that I didn't know about. <laughs> I mean, no, okay. the mics were never bought. I never, okay. never sold mics. OK. That's and, false rumor. And what about uh, I know P did a lot of business with you, you know, saying no limit. Um, what made you op be open to do that type of business with him? Cause I know he would buy a lot of the ads. He would buy a lot of that shit and then sure. fuck around and repackage it and sell it off. Sure. What, what was it just a straight up business money thing? Like shit, I'm getting my shit right now. So you can do whatever you want with it. You know what I mean? Once you get it to me now. So what made you be open to do that? Cause I know that was kind of out the, the norm, uh, of practice. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, if I recall, P started advertising with the source very mm -hmm. early on, yep. and he definitely was buying, you know, ads Double on page. a regular basis. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that opened the door to just some kind of business relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think me and P met pretty early on and just, you know, kind of got along. We've always had a great relationship all through the years. Mm -hmm. um, never had any, you know, problems with P at all one of the few, you know, stand up guys mm -hmm. in the business all these all these years. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, but then I think, you know, even though the source was, you know, we were based in New York, we had a lot of people from New York, but mm -hmm. we also had people, 
you know, that will work for us that were from other parts of the country, the West, the South. You know, we really strive to try to represent all the regions. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not sure. Sh- I, I know when Bout It, you know, started hitting, we were, you know, yeah. so obviously on top of that. And, yeah. you know, that kind of helped bring No Limit to another level of, sure. of credibility across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think, you know, we we were on on that that wave mm-hmm. a little bit with the music that mm-hmm. that uh, you guys were bringing, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, we just maintained a, a really a really great relationship mm-hmm. um, over the years. So, what made you you know you had a very successful run with the Source and the Source? How long was that magazine going strong? At least ten years. Uh, eighteen years 18. Uh, from when I started to when okay. I left. Yeah. When when did you put the Source down? Um, I, I left the source in 2006. Okay. And it yeah. stopped going into print and when? I mean, I, it still exists. Um, I don't really? think it's in print form. I haven't okay. seen it in print form in a while, but, you know, it does exist. It has, okay. you know, know social that. media, website. Okay. They, you know, they're still out there, uh-huh. um, you know. So what did you do? You just sold your shit, just sold your shares and just kept um, it pushing? It, it was complicated, you know, mm-hmm. in, in in a nutshell, as best I can explain, mm-hmm. I took out a big loan. I owned a company, um, you know, I, I was independently owned mm-hmm. for years, you know, I uh, didn't have any major partners, you know, corporations funding me, anything like that. Um, but when the dot coms uh, really came out in the late 90s, you know, every commercial on TV every day was dot com this, dot com that. There was, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars going into mm-hmm. dot coms. I kind of got caught up in the vision of what the Internet could do for mm-hmm. hip hop and for the global hip hop mm-hmm. audience and the source. And I'm like, man, this is the the pipeline, you know, yeah. basically to to the world. Right. Um, and we got to be there on a cutting edge. And so I I. I basically bet the farm on the internet business, took out a big loan, mortgaged mm-hmm. the magazine company, okay. took out a big loan. Mm-hmm. Source.com didn't get off the ground the way it was supposed to. Mm-hmm. I was kind of in over my head with mm-hmm. some of the financial things going mm-hmm. on. Um, had to bring in partners for the first time, a private equity fund. Mm-hmm. And you know, by the end, basically there was a disagreement with the private equity fund and, and uh, you know, I ended up leaving the company. Yeah. Um, it was unfortunate, you know, uh, but, uh, yeah. I yeah. Mean, I've had to do that. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I had, it, it reminds me of real estate, you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Cause I, I do, uh, uh, real estate investing as well. So yeah. it's some shit I had to walk away from, you yeah. know what I mean? It just didn't make business sense. So you just got to fucking walk away from it, yeah. you know, chalk it. Yeah. yeah. I get that. So, um, so once you do that, is that when you, you put that down and you transition into the hip hop weekly? Yeah, Hip Hop Weekly Mm -hmm. uh, came next, and, uh, you know, that was an idea to try to get back into the magazine Was that still print? It was print, yeah. Uh, That happened in 2006. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in those years, the the Celebrity Weekly magazines were huge. If you remember, you would go to the supermarket. Yeah, for sure. You know, Us Weekly, People Magazine, In Touch, this, Mm -hmm. that, and the other be... 10 of those magazines mm-hmm. up there, all pretty much with white celebrities. Right. So the idea was we can create an urban kind of version of of uh, that format. So it's kind of the know, shade room before the shade room. Something like that. Yeah. Well, we we try to be a little more yeah. respectable. Tasteful. Yeah. Uh, and tasteful, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, yeah. but the shade room, you know, obviously has done an amazing mm-hmm. job, built up a, a huge audience, mm-hmm. um, what they've been doing. But something you know, similar to that. So do you feel like you laid the foundation for people like Hollywood Unlocked and Say Cheese and World Star? Uh, you feel like the source was kind of the precursor? to to those platforms um i mean i i feel like the source you know has did a lot for hip hop as right. a culture you know not just you for know, sure media i think the source helped push hip hop uh further mm-hmm. you know to a place uh where it could be what it is today mm-hmm. um so i don't know whether any of those guys who all are you know you mentioned that all oh, have created you know really uh, robust platforms mm-hmm. um, over these past years or whatever. Mm-hmm. They may or, or may not have been influenced by the source. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if some of them, them were. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, they, they've been doing their, their thing, all those yeah. guys, you know. So what about your, what's up with the infamous beef with Eminem? 
where did that shit precipitate from? Like, what was that whole thing? And is that <laughs> still a thing? Um, I mean, I, no, I don't think it's a thing anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I would love to see Eminem and, and, you know, his, his manager, Paul and, and, and talk to them at some point. I haven't mm -hmm. done that in a long time, but, uh, you know, I think it just, it started out of a, a place of, um, feeling like, you know, it, well, first of all, let me, let me say this, the source basically helped discover and put Eminem on, you know, we put him in unsigned hype, mm -hmm. uh, before he had any deal with Dre or anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, he, uh, was the first white person ever on a cover of the source in mm -hmm. you know, all 10 years or whatever of our existence. He was the first one We gave him cover. He got two covers. Um, he won lyricist of the year at the source awards and amongst some heavy competition. Right. So, you know, we had a lot to do with supporting Eminem and helping push him out there in mm -hmm. the early stages of his career. Now, where things sort of went wrong a little bit was, if you recall, you know, when Eight Mile was getting ready to come out, mm -hmm. there was just sort of like a frenzy in the media, you know, at this point where it's like, you know, Eminem is the king of hip hop, his new movie is coming and he's mm -hmm. the greatest, you know, and... You know, I think it was Benzino who first kind of noticed that and felt a way about it and, you yeah. know, would share that with me. And then he went and made this song kind of, yeah. you know. he was very vocal about yeah, it. I dissing remember. him, yeah, on, on a mixtape. But it was a little thing and it just, yeah. it escalated really fast and mm -hmm. became something other than, you know, what it really was mm -hmm. uh, about, which was just about, you know, thinking about how who's controlling hip hop and right. you know right. what what the impact of a white artist of of his size mm -hmm. could have uh potentially on you know the business and the uh the culture and the mm -hmm. art form and, and everything else just given the history that we've seen with you know rock and roll and, and right. other forms of you know black music over the years right right i understand yeah i remember benzino was very vocal about that shit yeah so did you so you shared his opinion with that basically? Yeah, I think as far as you know some of the points about yeah. you know what could happen and that yeah. what we should be thinking about and being right. aware of um and but then like I said it kind of became personal between him and Eminem with the right. raps going back and forth and it just right. kind of spiraled out of control and mm -hmm. you know I don't think I probably made the best decisions you know about some of the things that, that we did, but, mm -hmm. um, um, but obviously now 10, 20, 15 years later, it's, you know, that's old shit at this point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Water under the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So I know recently voice to five, nine, y'all got into it on clubhouse. Was that about the same, the old shit basically? Yeah. 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 You know, that ended up coming up in a conversation that I mm -hmm. ended up in on a room and he was there and, mm -hmm. you know, he, he took offense to something I said and, mm -hmm. you know, try to get loud and then hung up on me or whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So I basically mean, it ain't about shit. It's just. No. Yeah. Man, just it's, hip hop posture and shit. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're long past that. We're at a whole yeah. different time now. Right. What, what um, are some of the, uh, what are some of the things that shocked you? Like I, we were just listening to the game earlier. I forgot that your name is in that first album. Sure. Like, what are some of the moments that like you like you got name dropped? You're like, how do I have anything to do with that? Like, <laughs> well, that's one of them. I, I I don't know anything about what he's talking about in that uh, in the dream song. You know, it's the, I have no idea whether he sent an unsigned hype tape in. Uh, I certainly wasn't the person reviewing the unsigned hype tapes. He said he was crushed. He said yeah. you crushed it. Right. You. <laughs> so I don't know if he was talking, you know, metaphorically yeah. or just sounded cool in the song. Yeah. I, I still never had a chance to, to ask him about that. But one of the other, you know, most exciting moments for me was, you know, Biggie, you know, because yeah. the source discovered Biggie. Um, you know, Maddie C and uh, uh, Mr. C are, 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 are talking um, and Mr. C, you know, tells Matt about this artist that he's uh, producing, you know, like a demo for and ends mm -hmm. up bringing him up to the office to play it. Mm -hmm. And Matt, you know, has a demo tape around the office and, you know, Matt's super excited as Matty C and, you know, puts him in the unsigned hype. We uh, 
uh, spring of 1992. Um, a few weeks later, um, I get a phone call from Puff, you know, who was my my guy. I've been, you know, fucking with him. He's at Uptown, you know, doing A and R, and tells me that they just gave him like a, an imprint deal for Bad Boy, and right. he's looking for artists. So mm-hmm. I go down to Maddie, like, hey, you know, who do we got? And he's like, oh, you know, we have Bigs and un- this guy Biggie's in unsigned hype this month. And I'm like, okay, bet, you know, so send this up to to Puff, and that's how he got signed. Like a month later, he signed a Bad Boy. Wow. And, you know, for me, when, when the first time I heard Juicy, yeah. you know, and you hear that smiles every time my face is up yeah. in the source. I mean, that was one of the few moments, <laughs> really, in yeah. all my years where I was like, you know, I really did have a smile on my face. And yeah. it really, you know, felt good yeah. um, at that particular, you know, moment in time. That was dope. Yeah. Mm. Damn, that's crazy because, yeah, you were a big part of that. So that's, yeah. Damn, I, did, I just put, I didn't put that together till mm-hmm. now. Yeah. Damn, so we're doing, I said, I might have mentioned it earlier, but we're doing a whole uh, documentary podcast series on Unsigned Hype, an eight part series. Okay. We tell the whole story of that column. You know, not mm-hmm. only Biggie, but Common, we discovered, got him his first record deal. DMX was in Unsigned Hype long before he was signed. Mm-hmm. Mob Deep, um, Capone and Noriega, David mm-hmm. Banner, Joel Santana, Pitbull, Jay Electronica. Mm-hmm. Is a bunch of, wow. of of great artists. That so came that through. unsigned hype platform that you're doing is it's a podcast. Yeah, it's a documentary series, okay. uh, eight parts that will. Uh, we're gonna drop a trailer uh, like in December, okay. and then start dropping the episodes. It? I'm not hosting it, no. Okay. But I'm I'm producing it for the network. Okay. When's it gonna drop? Uh, first of the year. Okay. What network? Yeah. Uh, it's Breakbeat. It's, oh, it's Breakbeat. On, yeah, okay, it's on, on our shit. network. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Now you created Breakbeat, and you did that with what in mind? Um, well, a few things. I mean, um, I feel like as big as hip hop has gotten, mm-hmm. and as much content as there is all over the place, everybody's mm-hmm. got shows, podcasts, this, that, and the other, um, and everything's kind of spread out. But I still feel like there's a void. You know, I feel like there's something that's been missing. You know, kind of the direction I was going with the source and the vision I had. Uh, you know, at the time it was to create more of a television network that was a well-rounded network that again covered everything from music to politics to sports to health to business, different things like that. But all with the hip hop, you know, aesthetic, the hip hop style, the point of view that kind of unifies us. I still right. think that. You know, I see this narrative that has kind of been pushed through the music industry that's really dividing the generations, you know, yeah, where you sure. have the older yep. people, oh, this mumble rap isn't real hip yep. hop. Oh, you guys yep. are just old and out of touch. And that narrative, a lot of people, you know, are playing into it. And, mm-hmm. and you know, what I see is, you know, you might be 49, mm-hmm. someone else might be 22. Now you might not like the same music anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you may the musical differences might be there, but if you dig beneath the surface a little bit more, hip hop is more complicated, complex. You know, exactly. and you get into the mind frame, the way yep. you look at the world, the way you think about things, mm-hmm. your perspective on issues. You know, tends to be you know shared with people who are part of hip hop versus people who really haven't been influenced by hip hop. Right. We are our own community, mm-hmm. and you know across a wide range of, of subject matters. So that's mm-hmm. really the vision of Breakbeat is to try to create programs and content that can cross from Gen Z through mm-hmm. millennials to Gen X, uh, try to bring us together more, try to bring that hip hop perspective into, you know, again, news, sports, documentaries, mm-hmm. you know, uh, every kind of thing you can imagine. And, um, you know, and, and we have some, technology plans for the company going forward Mm -hmm. you know to kind of move into the technology side Mm -hmm. with breakbeat next year Mm -hmm. so um you know that's that's uh part of the longer term you know nice nice is breakbeat a callback to the radio show it's a similar Um, name sounds like right no what i mean breakbeat um i'm sure some of you know the people watching this will know you know the breakbeat is the original building block of Hip hop, yeah, hip hop was sure. created the yeah. through the breakbeat in yeah. 1973 by, mm-hmm. you know, with DJ Cool Herc and, and others involved. Um, but that's the essence of hip hop as we know it today. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of people. You find hip hop in every facet of our society. Absolutely, you know everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, but what people don't always think about is that there's 
common threads and connections that go from what you see in this world today, hip hop being part of this, back to that breakbeat mm -hmm. that connect us. This is again part of the idea of trying to bring some more unification across mm -hmm. the generations that we really have more in common mm -hmm. from the breakbeat to the world of hip hop. What's your opinion of hip hop today? Um, I think that it's, uh, you know, it's in a great place in a lot of ways. It's it's obviously, you know, commercially, uh, you know, at a place it's never been in a lot of ways, you know, ever before. Um, uh, it seems to be, you know, a very strong musical economy um, and, you know, influencing other, other sectors as well. But, um, you know, I think that, you know, there's room to uh, evolve and grow right. and bring certain you know kind of social political yeah. cultural yeah ethical elements you know back into things yeah. and uh so get it more balanced like it was at a time yeah 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 and uh, you know i i see breakbeat as a, a, mm -hmm. a being able to play a part in that similar to the role that the source played for the community and the culture for many years um so i like yeah. that that's that's part of why we created this platform same thing because remember when we started i was like merging of the generations because it's kind of a disconnect a little bit you know you Definitely. got the old against the young you I was know right when kodak and p were kind of having exactly. their thing too when we talked exactly. about this so you know and it has to be respect on both sides on both parts you sure. know what i'm saying you have a lot of the ogs that's kind of like because i've had to explain to some guys my age i'm like look this is their time the same way that we swore by NWA, like you said, Ghetto Boys and all of that. Think about the people before us. They, you know, they came up on hip hop, not gangster rap. They mm -hmm. was like, what the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. Like they cussing on record and all that shit. Mm -hmm. But we swore by it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a revolving door, you know what I mean? Sure. So it evolves like everything else. But like you said, I think if people lead with respect, you know, at the end of the day, you know, because it's still all the same thing and everybody feeding their families is enough for everybody. No question. You know. <clears throat> no so, question. so where can we find you know Breakbeat? What what's all your your social media handles? And okay, well on Instagram we're at Breakbeat Media mm -hmm. and Twitter at Breakbeat Media. Um, you can find a Breakbeat Media YouTube channel uh, you mm -hmm. know on YouTube where uh, our visual versions of the podcast live. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, you know, don't call me White Girls when that's that's on there now. You should check out. Um, and we're on all the podcast apps, our audio versions. Um, so Spotify, Apple, mm -hmm. anywhere you get podcasts, uh, you can find the breakbeat shows. Uh, culture Roddy is the second one we have out. Um, our website, breakbeatmedia.com is kind of just like, if you want to get a sense of the whole company and what we're doing and, mm -hmm. uh, upcoming projects and things like that. Um, and you can listen and watch to episodes there, uh, from the shows, um, and uh yeah I, i'm excited about this funny marco show it's called uh uh the wrap it up show starring funny marco mm -hmm. i mean he's one of the most you know just the most influential people on instagram he's built a huge you know loyal following over yeah. the years just yeah. you know with uh, you know his pranks and antics but he just has a certain kind of comedic talent that i think is gonna mm -hmm. you know translate really well into the podcast space For and sure. i think he can be a big star yeah um and you know, i have my podcast the dave may show coming so this is really the first time you know people get to hear from me on a lot of mm -hmm. things and hear me in conversations with a lot of different you know uh you know significant influential people from the culture mm -hmm. uh, uh all walks of it um, you know, I've always been like a behind the scenes type yeah. of guy over the I was years. Gonna say so. you've always been kind of an enigma to yeah. an extent. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was intentional. I just, mm -hmm. just, you know, I was about the business and yeah. I didn't, you know, want the attention or mm -hmm. be out there, you know, getting the credit all the time. Um, but now it's a different day and age. Yep. Um, yep. I think my story, you know, is, is really relevant. I think my perspective on a lot of things in our world today is really relevant and I think people will enjoy hearing from from me and my For conversations sure. with others. And so I'm trying to take more of a, mm -hmm. a lead role this time and and mm -hmm. uh, getting my voice and my story out there. Yeah, for sure. Well, man, listen, I have to say for me, you know what I mean? I appreciate you. You contributed a lot to the culture. You know what I'm saying? I, I The source played a major role even in my career as a as an artist, especially in the 90s. You know what I'm saying? 
uh, you were able to give us a voice, you know, and a lot of us that were weren't in places where the industry was, you know what I'm saying? We got a glimpse into what that was. You know, mm -hmm. that was the first time because like you said, the magazines and publications before were pretty much fan shit, you know, just pictures and shit. But, you know, I read it religiously, you know, mm -hmm. the stories we got a chance to really see about our our favorite artists and got to look into, you know, who they were, their brand and all that. This was before social media, obviously. Sure. You know, so you know, we appreciate all your contributions. You Thank know what you. I'm saying? And in a in a in a small way, you know, you inspired even me, you know, to want to get into the media shit and you know, even create this uh podcast with my That's with my up. brother. So, you know, we appreciate you. Yeah, like that I'm all you contributed. Happy to have have me, you know, I'm happy yeah. you have me on the show. Yeah. Um and you know, we'll definitely Stay in touch and yeah, see if we can, sure. you know, build on some things. Absolutely, you know, for sure. absolutely. And yeah. shout out to the homie Funny Marco because that's the hometown. That's yeah. the home team, Kansas yeah. City, Missouri. You already yes. know what it is. Yes. So, yeah, I think you'll do well with him. So, yeah. you know, yeah, he got a prank right now, the yellow beezy one. Yeah, yeah, he just did, yeah. <laughs> that's, been, that's been going viral. Yeah, yeah, he's doing well with that. Yeah, we got pranked on this show too, the same way he got me. So don't don't call me white girl is the one behind the why you being weird to me. A lot of uh -huh. people don't know that, but that's okay. like one of the biggest viral moments of the year. Wow, you know, so far the okay. why you being weird to me. So yeah, that, that well, we got to get them on the show. We got to get her yeah. on the show and Funny yeah. Marco, so yeah. you can fedangle that for us. So wait, hold on, before we go though, because there's there hasn't been anyone that's done as much hip hop research as this man in his life, mm -hmm. and we do our top five with so many people. So what's, I mean, top five. For the guy who founded the source. Top, top five artists? Yeah, just top five. Influential albums, just what for you personally? Um, well and it doesn't artists or albums or well, artists. 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 Yeah. I mean Tupac. Um Biggie. Um Rakim. Uh I don't know. It's hard, man. Nas is up there for me. Um, face, face is up there for, for me. For sure. You know, um, even though he's mad at me. <laughs> uh, we should have got into that. <laughs> we do that on the next <laughs> but, show. But uh, uh, who else? Big face, Nas. Yeah, Rock I yet. mean, you know, Nipsey really yeah. means okay. a lot to me, man. Yeah. You know, I feel really strongly. The loss we suffered with him, man, was yeah. was, was really really big. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a solid list. I yeah, mean, it is. A lot yeah. of our it's our, a lot of our lists echo the same people. Okay, yeah. except yeah. we got Spice right. One on a bunch of our lists. Spice One yeah. was the shit. Yeah, man. Like, you can't Spice tell me nothing about Spice one. one. Yeah, he's my number one. And I used to I used to rock Spice One. <laughs> yeah, yeah, early yeah, early Spice, Spice supposed one. to be coming to the show too. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. And yeah. I got tell him I said what's up for contribution alone. Okay, yeah, he his was E forty. Okay, you know I was number one. Yeah. As far as on water. the show, I got uh man, my dream come true was to have Ice T and Jay Prince, which I had both of them on oh, the show. Man, that's so great. that was like my bucket list shit yeah, right there. That's great. Yeah, my third is the rock. So Okay. You know what I mean? If you know homie, I'll okay. let it for me. Okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll work on that. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Well man, thank you for yeah, coming, man. my brother. No, you, you got yeah. business to handle. Yeah. Man, you always welcome here, my brother. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to come back sometime. Yeah. And maybe for, bring some of the talent out. For here sure. You got like to. That. Got to. Yeah. All right, man, it's Big Court, producer Ken, Hold the Court Podcast with the homie Dave Mays. Salute.